Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome again to the new lecture of uh, the course fundamentals and applications of dielectric ceramics. So, we will briefly uh, look at what we did in the last lecture. So, in the last lecture we learnt about details of mechanism of We looked at details of ionic polarized, sorry, uh, ionic we looked at in the previous lecture, but in, in the last lecture we looked at uh, um, dipolar polarization or molecular, and then we looked at uh, interfacial. This happens because of presence of uh, dipole moments. at E is equal to 0 uh, molecular dipole moments let us say. So, this is basically talk in polar materials right and then we have interfacial which is due to presence of presence of charged entities or defects at various at, at various interfaces right. Now, because of masses of entities involved and uh, uh, they, are, uh, they are frequency dependent. So, some are sluggish, some are faster uh, and as a result they have a very strong frequency dependence. So, as we saw in the last lecture that our dielectric constant varies something like this. So, sort of rough plot. Okay. So, here we have 1, this is epsilon r electronic, this is epsilon r ionic, this is epsilon r uh, dipolar and this is epsilon r interfacial. So, these are the contributions that you get from different regimes. and this is frequency, this is epsilon r. So, this is what we should get ideally for every material. If you have only gases, you, you will only see this part. So, if you wanted to draw only for gas, you will you will have only this or, or, a, or a monoatomic solid, you will have, you may have some, sorry, for a let me use a different color yeah for a monoatomic solid you will have something like this you may have some interfacial polarization depending upon the type of interfaces that you have but basically you will have this oops this is the curve that you get for something like let's say silicon okay if you wanted to have something like NaCl or MgO, you may have something like this. Now, the values may change depending upon the type of the system because the masses of atomic masses are different and so on and so forth, but approximately you will get something like this for let us say MgO and mg is you know atomic mass of mg is different than silicon as a result there will be some changes in the values with respect to one but uh, let us ignore that right now for something like uh, something like water that is what you will get this is for basically a dipolar solid okay so these are the sort of curves that you are likely to obtain 
uh, but in reality you will uh, dielectric measurements are generally made at frequencies from you know 0.1 a few millihertz to um, few gigahertz let us say and they show various kinds of behaviors because of uh, contributions from other factors as a result the curves are uh, often deviate from ideal curves and as a result there is a whole new area of dielectric analysis whole area of search of dielectric analysis and impedance spectroscopy which one needs to conduct in detail. Anyway, so now another quantity that we introduce here is called as dielectric polarizability. Basically, dielectric polarizability is uh, ability of a dielectric material to polarize. Okay, so higher the dielectric polarizability, more the dipole moment is going to be. So the dielectric polarizability of an of a species. So dielectric polarizability is defined as uh, sorry, it's called as alpha. So for a species i, I define alpha i and this is equal to mu i divided by e. Now, this e is often taken as local electric field or microscopic electric field, but let us not worry about that, that is a different treatment altogether, let us just worry about the macroscopic field. So, basically alpha is equal to mu divided by e. So, this is called as dielectric polarizability. So, it defines the uh, uh, and it is also essentially you can say is uh, when alpha is higher. So, you can say that mu i is equal to alpha i into e okay. and mu is related to polarization because polarization is equal to sigma mu i divided by v and this is equal to chi divided by epsilon naught e. So, basically what we are saying is that higher the polarizability of the system is more the polarization of the system will be which is because of higher dielectric constant of the material uh, that is there. So, let us so polarizability is a quantity that can be analytically defined using a simple treatment. So, that is why we will do uh, analysis of polarizability of uh, different classes of materials. So, let us say first the treatment of uh, uh, polarizability of electronic polarization okay so let's we'll see what kind of parameters does it depend upon so let's first bring a um, let's make a simple picture so we'll we have a nucleus which is of some charge and then center of the nuclear charge let's say so these are variety of orbitals and let us say we apply a electric field so that this positive charge and the negative so this this is the sort of electron cloud this gets shifted little bit in this direction and as a result the center of this charge is now yes. so this is your you can say center of electron cloud and this is center of positive charge this is basically nucleus right. So, this is plus q and this is minus q. So, when electric field is not equal to 0 then we separate these two by a magnitude delta and you have a corresponding dipole moment right there is a dipole moment that is created between the two entities. So, upon application of electric field E, so obviously when E is 0, 
the mu is also 0 right because the centers of charges coincide okay because of coincidence of coinciding of centers of positive and negative charges. However, when we apply electric field E on the charges, let us say, so let us say this, when you apply charges, what will happen is you will create a force. This force F is Z into E E. Okay. So, as a result, you will have forces on the two charges, you will separate them by a distance, let us say delta or D, whatever you may call it. But this force that you apply by applying electric fold, there is a coulombic force of attraction as well, because they have to be held together. It is not that you cannot, you can rip them apart, you cannot. There is a coulombic force of attraction. So, this force is balanced by what we call as, so balancing force is then, so this is the applied upon application of a fold, this is F A, this is the applied force. The balancing force, let us say, we write it as F B. Balancing force is because of Coulombic attraction between the positive and negative charges. And what will that be? That will be Q of nucleus into Q of the charges that dis reside between the distance d, right, or delta the negative charges within delta divided by 4 pi epsilon naught into into delta square. And what will this be? this will be basically, let us say if this is Z E, okay, this will be, since we are taking, we can take the ratio of, uh, again this will be total charges Z E, but we are taking how much it has been, because it depends upon the extent of force, right. So, so depending upon the size of that bigger sphere, let us say, or a smaller sphere, so it will be 4 by 3 pi delta cube divided by 4 by 3 pi capital R cube. But capital R is the complete uh, radius of the whole, whole electron cloud, but delta is basically the distance that we have created by separation. So, the moment they are equal, both the forces will be equal. So, this is basically you can say is equal to z square e square into a small delta. Um, sorry, um, and this is divided by 4 pi epsilon naught delta square. So, if you do the maths, you will have z square e square 4 by 3 pi, these will cancel each other, you will have delta divided by uh, 4 pi epsilon naught into r cube. This is the expression that we will get. So, let us say there is a equilibrium separation. So, at equilibrium delta is equal to delta naught. Okay. So, when we do that uh, and so at equilibrium delta is equal to delta naught and F A is equal to F B. right? So, when you do that together applied force is equal to balancing force. By balancing the two forces we can find out, we can determine delta naught is equal to 4 pi epsilon naught into R cube into E divided by Z E. So, you can calculate now the dipole moment, dipole moment is equal to basically we said it is equal to uh, basically alpha E into E. So, what is alpha E? Alpha E is 4 pi epsilon naught. Um, so, this is sorry mu is also equal to uh, z e into delta right so you have to write it z e into delta and delta is delta naught right so now when you balance it you will get alpha e expression which is 4 pi epsilon naught 
into R Q. So, what it tells you is that for a given atom the atomic polarizability depends only on the radius of atom. So, alpha E is basically proportional to R cube, this is a constant, this is a constant only R is the variable. So, bigger the atom is more polarizable the atom is which makes sense because for smaller atoms the electron cloud is closer with respect to nucleus whereas for bigger atoms the coulombic force of balancing coulombic force is smaller as a result they are more polarizable the electrons can shift or it can get polarized to longer distances as compared to uh, easily as compared to um, for smaller atoms. And correspondingly if you say the dipole density was n then p will be equal to 4 pi epsilon naught into n into r cube into E if n is equal to dipolar dipole density which is number of dipoles per unit volume. Okay. So, basically we are saying so we can get from this we can get uh, um, so, alpha E is 4 pi epsilon r cube, you can also determine chi E which is 4 pi n into r cube. So, bigger the atom is higher the polarizability of a atom is. So, this is the take home message from, from this and then we can now uh, see the uh, few values. For example, if you look at halogens, you look at alkali metals. So, for halogen fluorine is uh, 1.2 into 10 to the power minus into 10 to the power 24 centimeter cube. Uh, chlorine is uh, 3 into similar value, bromine is uh, 4.5 into and sorry iodine is um, 7 into similar value. So, you can see that it goes as size of the atom, fluorine is the smallest atom, chlorine iodine is the biggest atom and it scales with similarly for alkali metals if you go from lithium to let us say uh, sodium to potassium, lithium has a value of point, point 0 0.03 into 10 to power 24 same unit and then 0 0.3 and then 0 0.9. Okay. Polarizability is alpha. Sorry, alpha is per centimeter cube. Yeah, you're right. Centimeter cube. Four pi epsilon naught centimeter cube. Okay. All right. So now uh, let's move to the analytical treatment of ionic polarizabilities. Now, in case of ionic polarizability, we adopt a slightly different picture. So, the first picture is that when we have these ensemble of atoms, so let us say and in between we have these smaller atoms sitting. Okay. And, uh, so, if you look at the value of mu, so this is let us say um, negative, this is positive, this is negative, this is positive, negative and uh, in between we will have these ions negative. So, this will be essentially positive, this is positive, this is positive, positive, positive and then we have negative, negative, negative. So, the dipole moments essentially will cancel out, you will have uh, one in uh, this direction, another in this direction. So, when E is equal to 0, the mu is equal to 0. Okay. Now, you change the picture a little bit. So, you let us say E is not equal to 0. If E is not equal to 0, that means you will polarize some parts more with respect to other. 
So, there is a possibility you might create a scenario or something like that. So, so what will happen is that this red ion will shift more towards let us say this green ion. as a result you can see that. So, this is um, you know red is positive. So, essentially there, be, there is a dipole moment in this direction other dipole moment is in this direction. So, mu 1 and mu 2 they are not equal to each other okay, because of separation differences. As a result you can say the mu net is not equal to 0. So, this is what we will create. So, we have a equilibrium separation and then we have a change separation. So, it decreases. So, the basically you can say the distance between the ions increases by your amount delta in one direction and decreases by the same amount delta in another direction. Okay. So, as a result you have this difference of delta d, uh, the d difference that is called a delta mu difference that will come in the two. So, we need to calculate this. So, we can say accordingly you have a shift net shift by some value d. Okay. So, we need to calculate this. So, let us say the force F 1 which increases the distance between two ions is basically. So, when you apply electric field you create a force F 1. So, upon application of electric field we separate these ions. So, as a result you will have F 1 is equal to Q into E. So, this is the force that is caused which causes the separation, but as it at the same time the if you imagine that these ions are connected to each other by springs right, there will be a restoring force. So, the restoring force will be F 2 this will be equal to k into d where k is the spring constant and d is the distance. So, let us say I represent this as k i. Okay. This is the second equation that we have. So, this is basically assuming that at ions are connected to each other just like springs. So, just like they are harmonic oscillators kind of model and this spring constant can be represented in terms of. So, this small k i can be represented in terms of elastic modulus. So, this is given by y elastic modulus into d i. This y is elastic modulus and d naught is the equilibrium separation. Okay. So, now it seems straightforward now. So, at equilibrium what will happen? At equilibrium these two forces F 1 and F 2 will balance each other and you combine these equations what we will get D will be equal to Q into E divided by Y into D naught. So, mu will be equal to q dot d which is equal to q square e divided by y d naught. So, what is alpha i here? q square divided by y d naught this is equal to this is what is ionic polarizability. What does it depend upon? It depends upon what is the equilibrium separation and what is the elastic modulus. So, which means the more stiff the bond is or in some sense more strong stronger the bond is more difficult it is to polarize it and that makes sense right. Stronger the bond is. So, basically you can see that alpha i is inversely proportional to 1 over i which is stiffness which is proportional to bond strength. So, something which has more melting point it will be difficult to polarize, something which has lower melting point it will be easy to polarize. 
and accordingly you can also calculate the polarization. So, polarization will be equal to n into mu and this will be equal to n q square e divided by y d naught. One thing that you might note here is there is no temperature dependence here. It is independent of temperature. So, this alpha i is independent of of temperature. Similarly, in the previous case we saw this is also independent of I mean you might have some change in R that is happening with respect to, but there is no anomalous there is no strong dependence upon temperature except that the size will change as a function of temperature. So, there is no temperature term as such. Okay. So, so, this is basically a very rough guide to calculation of ionic and electronic polarizabilities. So, if you consider now for these, if you compare the values of different materials, uh, for instance, you take for uh, ZNO, ZNAC, let us say, and uh, so ZNO, ZNS, ZNO has a value of uh, um, the electric constant of uh, ZNS is 5.1. ZNO is 4.6 and ZNSE is 5.8 and these differences are basically because of changes in the uh, bonding characteristics of these materials. So, basically stronger the material is uh, higher the dielectric constant will be for a given material uh, sorry stronger the material lower the dielectric constant because the smaller the polarizability will be. So, you can say strong bonds meaning lower ionic polarizability. Bigger atoms are easy to polarize, electronic polarizability, stronger materials are difficult to polarize that is ionic polarizability in case of ionic polarizability. So, these are the two treatments that we have done in the next class we will look at the treatment of uh, dipolar polarizability, which is an interesting case to look at. Okay. Thank you very much.